Yeah. Yeah. You have your your D is a, an aspirated tia. Tiana. Right? Tiana. Yeah. 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 So it's not exactly. a it's not a D. It's a D. D. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah, you know more about it than me. Yeah, I know that's you where my name comes from. Clearly, it's it's that. Oh God, where is it? It's it's that kind of a D, right? Yeah, that looks right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you say it, say it properly. Say my name, Diana. Yeah, right. With the breath and the yeah, with the aspirated D. Right that's amazing. Yeah. Anyway, cool. Well, this is perfect. So, uh, <laughs> welcome to the Conversation Factory, Diana Scarano. Or D, Thanks we'll just call you D. Thank you for making the time. This is actually, um, for me, it's always fun to talk to other uh, geeks about yeah. conversation design. And um, when I first saw, when we were at, met in uh, San Francisco at the Google thing, um, I was like, wow, here is a person who likes to break things down into chunks as small as I do. Yeah. Right, and That's so that was like, interesting. A kindred spirit. So I'm really glad you made the time. Um, My pleasure. And so the, I'm wondering, how do you introduce yourselves at parties? When somebody asks you what you do at a party, how, what, do you, what, do you, what do you say in that moment? Say, I love this question and I've heard you ask it to people before as well. So I've thought about it, but now oh, I realize good. I actually come up with a really <laughs> concise answer because like other people have answered this question as well, it really depends who you're talking to. Yes. If we're meeting um, if I'm meeting a totally um, brand new person, my background is completely a, a designer, UX um, service product design. So I'll say things like, I'm a UX designer. Have you heard of that? <laughs> mm -hmm. no? um, okay, I design things, but not in a visual way. Um, uh, I help companies and people who want to make something, often digital, yeah. but I help them figure out what they should make and what people will really want and how it should really work so that it will really solve a problem. And, um, and sometimes there's a visual aspect, but it's more about figuring out what people should, should do and how it should work. So that's the really at parties answer yeah. to your question. That's a good, that's a good answer. Yeah. So this is the question I have. It's interesting because I think there's some designers who are allergic to the idea of process. And there are some designers who, like you clearly, have fallen in love with process. Like, so what's the journey do you think from, uh, what was your journey into process? Maybe let's just, let's just say that. That's oh, wow. Um, that's a really good question. I've been, it's been about 10 years that I've been doing this, this uh, kind of thing that I'm doing now. Yeah. And I have to say at the, so maybe the first few years were all about learning really a way of thinking, um, and a theory and maybe learning little bits of process. Like if you want to solve a problem, start with talking to the people who have the problem. <laughs> and uh, oh, that's a good place to start. If, if that's even super open still, but like, Oh, that's a starting place. And then maybe you try and analyze and understand what that means. And then maybe go, go back and check if you understood. So really yeah. slowly learning that, there's, there can be, depending on what you're trying to do, there can be a, a good way to kind of get started and there's no right way yeah. to do it every single time. You need to adjust a little bit. And then now to where I am now, which is, which is really 100%, the last year I've had this job, but um, really 100% doing design sprints, which is a super, super strict process that you just follow piece by piece like a recipe. You just... Yeah. On to the next step. There's no kind of mixing and matching of um, of different methods and tools. It's really just set out for you to really discovering that that also is not the only way I would ever do anything now, but it's yeah. a really useful um, thing because it gives you freedom to really just think about the problem that you're trying to solve yeah, and, yeah. Not, and figure out what method you should use and what tools you should use and all the different things you could do. You can just leave all of that because it's set for you. And you so can now, you're, now it's like it's sounding like you're living under a communist regime and liking it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they, they just take so all nice. these decisions away from you and it's just like so great. But so, <laughs> so let's talk about that. It's it's, sense of when, yeah. So it is this sense of freedom. If, if you agree and if you really see yeah. the value in using the tool, like, uh, and this is really a decision as well. And like I said, it's definitely not 
the only thing ever that I would use if I have a problem to solve. Yeah. It's just a really good one. And the, the kinds of things we're working on, working for, for companies, for clients yeah. um, to solve their big business problems, then it's a really good tool to use in that situation. And knowing the, then getting to know a process really well, like I'm sure a lot of designers, coaches, facilitators have their kind of toolbox. Maybe there's a few things in there, but they're like, I know this works. I know yeah. this gets people together to solve the problem together. Yeah. I know if I follow this, we're going to get an answer out of it, out of it. And you can just keep applying that. And it's, it's a really freeing thing because yeah. you really just don't have to struggle and come back. Um, I'm not sure if the people here will get what we're doing. I know that if you guide people through people, it, it always has an outcome every single time. It always yeah. an answer. And, and it is a really freeing thing. And so, I mean, it's something like last night, um, actually I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing um, Kai later today. Oh, great. So it's sort of like a funny, Kai Haley. Uh, yeah. yeah, Kai Haley. So and it's funny. I was listening to an episode, uh, a podcast episode that she was on where like the guy was like, interviewing her to like basically take her through every step and i think that is completely unnecessary right yeah here because you guys at aj and smart like make videos up the wazoo you have a, oh yeah i mean you can just read the sprint book in one transatlantic flight yeah um, so there's lots of resources but um i'm curious it, it's interesting because it's like there's this rejection of uh, there's some designers who are like no process and you're sort of, you've had this journey where it was like, well, we should definitely talk to the people who have the problem. Yeah. And it sounds like you've also made the evolution from which I think a lot of UX designers do where it's like, well, it's about the customer. And you're like, well, actually there's like 40 customers. As yeah. It turns out. And it seems like the sprint is a great way of getting all the stakeholders involved early yeah. on in the process. So it seems like a culmination of some of that yeah. human centeredness. I think one of the reasons I've really fallen in love with this particular process, the design sprint is from struggling or not struggling, but seeing in many, many other jobs that I've had, how difficult it can be to get a bunch of people all feeling aligned. And often the group, it's not a group of people, but it's, yeah one person from this department, another person from there and also the product owner and also the, the CEO or someone. And they're not a, they're not a team. They're not really working as a group of people yeah. and everyone's got different opinions about things. And it's just felt normal. It felt normal um, for a long time that that's the way that things work and you just have to get through those things um, and get through to the other end. But having this, uh, being able to just take this thing that magically yeah. um, magically gets all the people in the room for you and and guides all of them at the same time through the yeah. same thought process through the same way of thinking about the problem first and then then once we 've refined that trying to think about the solution next and then making sure we actually tell thing with people and talk to people and yeah. understand what they think about it this is the part of the magic of that frustration that probably you, probably most people listening to this yeah. have felt like, why can't people just try and understand what the, the, the head of development is going to have different ideas than the customer service person because yeah. they're hearing different things. They've got different problems. Um, so that's another reason why this, this process, the process like this really just yeah. is such a support for a designer. And I'm, and I'm going to, um, I'm guessing one of the things that I think is very interesting about the about sprinting in general, like a workshopping, is is the cadence of work is very um, uh, loose in normal design processes, and it can expand to infinity and beyond. And it can be very hard to get all the information you need. It can be hard to get people in the room, um, and it can be hard to say, well, well, now that we've agreed on this, what are we going to do next? With the sprint, there's this very tight cadence. Get both yeah. hands in the frame where you're yeah. only going to you're going to fit it into this week and you are going to get something out of it and i'm it's interesting like at aj and smart you don't sprint every you don't sprint every week what's the difference of like cadence the cadence of sprinty work versus cadence of non-sprinty work like why what are the pluses and minuses yeah. of each type of um approach in your work well well to be honest uh, I'm not sprinting every single week now because I'm doing uh, 
teaching training a lot. So I'm actually sprinting the next two weeks in a row, but a lot of my colleagues really actually do sprint every week. It really is. We have a thing now where we have to, we make sure, I think it, it's either four or five now. We're trying to get it right. Post-it notes falling off the table. Um, <laughs> that it could be four or five weeks in a row of sprinting with, with new problems with new teams each time, or maybe two weeks in a row with the same team. Um, and that, that cadence is really intense, but we also do a four week sprint. So we have a day of yeah. um, retrospective refining, wrapping up and preparing for the next thing. Sorry, four day, right? A four do, day sprint. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing four day. You said a week yep. and I was like, that's probably not it. Sprint. Um, <laughs> So there is a little break, but it's so back to your, to your point. Of yeah. It's not necessarily every single week that you're doing the same thing. So that, that you're doing, that we're doing sprints. Yeah. But uh, in the in-between, if we do have a week in between, it's usually about things like refining our process. We, we do retrospectives after every single sprint that we do just on the, the process itself yeah. and not the actual changing the exercises. Yeah, yeah. Rarely, but sometimes, but um, how can we make, things smoother, how was the room, how was the the uh, times we came in to offer more drinks, how was the flow yeah. of the exercises, do we yeah, want yeah. to change the timing? Um, so those downtimes usually are about about that or having a bit of preparation to go into the, the next sprint or doing some follow-up, wrap-up things with the client. Now, so it is because I'm curious if on the non sprint days, you guys yeah. are still structuring your dialogue. Ah, oh, okay. You know, no, I, I don't, I don't think that was my question yeah. when I started, but now I'm like, okay, okay. So, because like, I remember you doing the lightning decision jam with yeah. everyone and yeah. you know, that is often, you know, that's my workshop approach is like, okay, here are these activities and let's thread them together and get people to a thing. Yeah. When it's Friday and there's no sprint and you guys are talking about yep. whatever internal thing, how do you guys manage that conversation? Yeah. How do you design so that, that dialogue? You're ex exactly right. We use the lightning decision jam, which we can put a link, I'm sure in the, the show yeah. notes, which is a really also st completely structured exercise that borrows uh, concepts, ideas from the sprint, like the noting down, sticking up, everyone voting, making decisions, focusing, moving on, noting yeah. down again. Um, so it's, it takes some of those principles and puts them into a really short exercise that we use. You can use for just general decision making, like, oh, we're having a rambling discussion right now mm -hmm. with three, four people. Let's do a quick LDJ. And we'll come out the end with the, with the answer. We know that will happen, but we use it for retrospectives as well. Mm -hmm. We start with um, noting down all the things that worked well, things that didn't work well. Yeah. Yeah. And then going into this structured cycle of decision-making and using especially the favorite, my favorite thing is I'll probably say my favorite thing like 10 times, <laughs> by the way, lots of favorite things. Everything's your favorite thing. That's is, fine. The, yeah. is the effort impact scale that I'm yeah. sure lots of people have seen before, mm -hmm. um, which really just helps you take a lot of different ideas or potential solutions and find a place to start, which one is going to be the easiest and have the most impact. Let's start with that one. And we can yeah, yeah. So this is really interesting and let's unpack this because um, this comes up a lot. You guys, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think similar to me, you do uh, impact first. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have people do difficulty. Yeah. Um, what's the value, do you think, of separating those two conversations out in that oh, form? Okay. Instead of like, because I know people who do, who literally have them at the same time where we do the two by two and we just sort of like, oh, I think this goes there. Yeah. So what's the value of separating it into two separate conversations? That's a good point. I never, I mean, now that you say that, I'm thinking, of course, there's, of course that you need to separate them, but I never thought about that before. That's this, the natural thing that came to mind, but there's such, they're competing things. Mm. They're, they're not necessarily, um, but if your brain thinks about uh, these two very different things at the same time, yeah, you kind of, I think would start to rank like, Rank yeah. them against each other in you some ways. You conflate them. In, yeah, that's a better word. I, I'm sure you've seen like teams where their ideas are a straight arc up and you're like, no, no, you didn't actually separate difficulty yep. 
from importance. Because if yes. everything important is difficult, yes. like in a linear way, then there's something going on. Yeah. I think. yeah. And now that you have said about the order as well, I think if you did do it the other way around and you thought about the level of difficulty first, even if you mm -hmm. separated the two, but thought about the, the effort or the level of difficulty first, then it could get you to think, oh, well, this is going to be so difficult to do. Mm. Maybe it's not that important. So I think that impact, thinking about the impact first and how much would this make a difference to the problem we're trying to solve is yes. definitely the most important one to, to do first. And then if it's really, e then if you're actually also, it could be done in a really easy way, then it's a, like a must do thing. Yes. So this is, so I'm going to, let's continue unpacking this. This is great. So did, yeah. did Jonathan, the originator of the LDJ or did, or is uh, it was or is before it you? my time? It was before it was, your time. It was, it was before my time at AJ and smart, but really funnily enough, I was doing with my design thinky service design background. Yeah. I was doing the same exercise, but I didn't have the, no, I even did have the effort. I didn't have the, um, there's a part right at the end where after you've done the effort impact scale, mm -hmm. you, um, just take the, the, top, the top left one, the high impact, low effort, or the top three or whatever you want to take and just really write down on one post-it note the three action steps to start that activity so that you can come out of this session, meeting, whatever it is, with who's taking this post-it note, who's going to make the, like start this, this happening. Yes. So that's, the last. so that's the only thing I never did before, but I really was doing the exact same exercise. Yes. It's interesting. So I'm just, I'm going to draw it because I'm drawing like this. Because I, I, do you do good at the bottom yeah. or hard? Good or hard. We, I, we actually put, I'm not even sure. You do it. Reason. You do it the other way around. Put, uh, impact, impact up the side. I mean, it's the mm -hmm. same thing. High impact. impact. High, yeah, that's interesting. Impact. Oh, that's going to be super Effort. confusing, isn't it? So here's the thing that's interesting to me. Yeah. Um, like, I think some people would suppose that you would, oh yes, that you should just do the things that are yeah. very good and not very hard. Yeah. Um, but but yeah. I, I, when I teach this, I say to people, this stuff that is very hard and very good still has a reason to exist sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did, I've done workshops where the CEO is like, we only want things that are strategic moonshotty things that's what yeah. we're here to do we and were, i think there's a my so objection is that like you are not always living in this world of like let's yeah. do the goodest least hard thing <laughs> i like this terms better. <clears throat> we we kind of suggest it's the same thing really but to go on the so this is what else yeah like. yeah exactly so look at that. across the top um I mean, this, this whole, uh, which one is it? This one, yeah. this whole quarter is interesting, but you could, these things on the left here yes. could be like, let's, let's just test this next week. Let's do a quick test and make that exactly. happen. And with one team or a small thing, see if it works. Mm -hmm. And the other things that are really not more effort, let's put them into the project backlog uh, or like put them into the next, the next quarter of uh, project cycle and, mm -hmm. and, get started with, with those then, but there's things you can usually try right away. Exactly. By the time you get to the next quarter project cycle, you might've actually solved the problem with something that was, that was easier to do. Yes. And so what's interesting about this diagram, what I love about your thinking about it is that it's clear to me that you could teach an entire day long workshop about this diagram, much like I could. It's like, yeah, you're like, well, okay, how do we prototype these things? How do we make these things juicier? Yeah. You know, what do we do to make these things more relevant? Like, cause somebody had this idea and we shouldn't just throw it away. Well, that's a good, that's a, this is a really good point as well, which is, it's a really interesting point actually, which wasn't even on my radar to talk about that. The, the feeling of, you know, all of these processes that we use and methods and mindsets that we have, the feeling, the uncomfortable feeling of losing ideas. Yes. Um, and I'd be interested to hear what, what if you want to go further with what you you were saying there of like what like how can we take these other ideas and make them more relevant or impactful but we at least and i always had this feeling as well and aj and smart now working here for years kind of drilled into me that and I've to, i'm totally converted and totally believe that it's much it's really worth it for you to develop that um 
capability of killing your darlings. Is that a term that everyone understands? Of it not is a, worrying. It's a, an, an editing classic. I'm a, yeah. You must not worry about all those other post-it notes that are on here somewhere. Yes. Don't worry about them. Put them in the bin immediately. Don't think about them again. Just yes. pick the ones you want to work on and move on. And if those things were really kind of interesting enough, yes. then if you do another session the next time, they'll come yes. up again. But you'll slow yourself down if you try and catch I, every single idea. So this is so interesting. And I think um, yeah. I'm going to reference, you might find it interesting, but whoever else is listening to it might find it interesting. The interview I did with uh, Marsha Ackerman, she teaches structural dynamics in conversation theory, which I knew nothing about. And she talks okay. about like how conversations are about either moving things forward. Uh, some yeah. people love to, I think of it as opening, exploring, and closing. So yeah. some people are openers and they're like, okay, let's, what's next? What's next? And some people are like closers where you're like, okay, we need to do something with this. What are we doing with this now? Yeah. And other people are like explorers where they're like, let's just, and I tell people this, like, let's just take a, a like a bath with this data. Let's just, <laughs> you know, yeah. if you really want to synthesize this data, let's just get in there and just, you know, light a candle and just relax. See where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this, you know, I want to talk about this idea of faster decisions and, and ending endless discussion because it is a problem. But yeah. I think the other, it can, it can off, that can become its own problem because the term she uses that everyone is stuck in moving forward. Like yeah. you always want to move forward. And sometimes you do need to be like, well. this is great. Yeah. We've got to like, okay, wait a minute. Like let's build a roadmap first. Yeah. Like maybe we need to have the roadmap and maybe that's not happening in the sprint. But it has this. This conversation is a worthwhile conversation to have. Yeah, this develop this developing a kind of a roadmap so that we can see where we yeah. are in the thing. Yeah, that's actually a really nice point. The sprint is very like more what I was saying before. Like once you have decided on something, you kind of forget the rest, and then you go like you do you do that yeah. with the problem problem framing. We've got the problem in the target area. Forget everything yes. else. Now let's try and solve that one problem. Lots of solutions. Let's pick the best one or two and forget all the other ones. And, just and move just, on with the rest of our lives. Yeah. Because I've heard people be like, well, let's put it in a spreadsheet. I'm like, why would you do that? Like, <laughs> yeah, like you that, gonna, you're creating debt and. Yeah. And you're going to slow yourself down because when you come time to, to do some more, like when it comes time to do the next bit of work, right, we've got a ne next quarter now. Are you still stuck on what you were thinking three months ago instead of yeah. looking at the world the way it is now? Yeah. So I don't know if I have any kind of real, I'm not sure if you're looking for an, 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 uh, roadmap, make, having a roadmap for, for figuring out where the other pieces might fit because I have been much more working in this mindset of leave everything behind. Yeah. Start with, let's make this decision and move on. Well, yeah, it's, it seems like you can take a picture of the lightning decision jam board and that is like, there are all the other how might we's yeah. there. Yeah. Like that is that's your roadmap. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Or picking the top few, like, or picking that, that top section and making that roadmap of, like, these are the highest impact things, but let's make a plan of which ones we do. Like, yeah. just going across from left to right. Is this going left to right now? <laughs> going across left to right. <laughs> Easy one first. This one could be a, something we start next week and maybe it takes a few weeks. This one could be a big project that goes into the next cycle. Yeah. So something that came up when we were in um, San Francisco at the Google conference was this idea of like micro sprinting, which is sort of funny because it's just, I think it's just another term for structure dialogue. Like somebody could use the yeah. impact difficulty matrix anytime. Yeah. You're doing a lot of teaching now. One of the questions I get when I teach people these tools, they're like, well, how do I get permission to do this? And like, how do I get, like, how do you handle this sort of, cause people like yeah. some people I feel like, um, empower themselves and other people are waiting for permission and there's there's a whole spectrum in, in between yeah we I just did a big training uh, workshop uh, teaching really for the first time a group of people from the same organization about design a few people kind of wanted everyone else to get into design sprints and they brought uh, 15 people with them mm -hmm. all top level managers of different teams to really show what design sprints can do and we did a big workshop um, and that was the big goal is this, I don't remember how many thousand people, but many thousands of people in, in an organization and these a uh, few higher level people really wanted to get the whole organization working in this way. Yeah. And it wasn't a digital company at all, actually, which is really interesting, but, 
um, all the different departments. Uh, they wanted, they really, and that was their big question they came with, like, yeah. how can we get this scaled inside our organization? Yes. And personally, and I, th and I think some of my colleagues would have slightly different opinions or even disagree with me, um, that I really believe that the best way to get to basically propagate a process or an idea or a way of working inside a, a team or a company is to just start doing it. If you can't find anyone else who you can get excited, like even if you can't find two or three other people who you kind of think it sounds interesting, maybe you're out of luck. <laughs> but mm. if you can find a few other people who think it sounds interesting and you've got a problem that you want to solve together and you've got this new this process, this method that you want to use, just mm -hmm. do it with that team, put, put effort into um, learning how to do it, doing it well, but then the most into showing the outcomes of what you've done. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and very, this has become part of my teaching as well, is, uh, which I actually stole from, from Jake, from Jake Knapp, who created this, <laughs> of showing the default, showing the way that we would normally have done this. Showing, a, for example, showing a project that you did last year, <coughs> Thing. Yeah. How long it took to to do each thing, to do the research, to do the development, to have have 10, 15, 30 different project meetings with different people mm. to, to build the thing, develop it, finally get it out to market. Finally, maybe and it's and it's less than what you thought it was going to be in the first place because you've had to de-scope it now because there were too many different things going on. Yeah. How long that all took and how much money yes. and then show them what you did in a for example, in a, in a design sprint in one week and that you've actually got validated data now from people saying, yes. oh, we were a bit wrong with this guess, but we found that out in four or five days yeah. and now we know exactly what to build and that took us eight months in the last project cycle to do that yeah. with a similar project. And then when you really show, so don't skimp on the showing, to yeah. try it yourself with a little team and show everyone how much impact it's had and if you can do that well, you'll have other teams and other people and the rest of the organization saying, could you come and show us how to do that yeah, too? Yeah, it's so interesting because it, what comes to mind is um, uh, I, I interviewed Sarah Holobeck last year and she talks about like the $20 million mistake that like pretty much every VP will make at yeah. some point in their career. And it's shocking. It's $20 yeah. million is a lot of fucking money for me. Yep. Yeah. Um, like, <laughs> I don't have I, no idea. That total sidebar, and I'm curious yeah. for you. Like, I think everybody's got their um, uh, fuck you amount of money where it's like you register for an event and it's like 20 bucks, and you're like, whatever, I don't care. Yeah. Like, yeah. $20 is still a lot of money to me. Or I'm like, yeah. oh, I should totally get out of bed. I should totally go because I paid I would $20 definitely to go. do it. Right. Yeah. If it was $5, you might be like, that's mm -hmm. maybe, yeah. yeah. Eight. Eight. If it's getting to 10, 12, I think that would be my. Can yeah. you imagine losing twenty million dollars and still getting to keep your job? Like yeah. I would life goals, am I right? Like <laughs> that, yeah, that's where I want to be. I want yeah, to that's where I want to be in my life. <laughs> where, I, where I can lose that. I should ask my boss right now. What's the yeah. amount? <laughs> what's the yeah, amount? what's the what's <laughs> my range? <laughs> yeah. So I it's know definitely more than five dollars. Yeah, so that's especially less than twenty million. I hate thinking about money, which is so ridiculous because that's all like Companies You're a designer. I get it. Paying we're us designers. to do stuff for them. Um, it's all about when we're designing things, we're often having to <coughs> use the rationale that this, like, I'm designing something for a, for a yes. client, for a company. The rationale is often this will make you more money. If you make your users happier, you yeah. keep up user engagement. This will make you more money. That's the reason for doing it. But I hate thinking about that. Um, but that's a way that people can really convince yeah. other people to change their, their way of thinking and way of working is using that sometimes are you, you also selling the fun aspect of sprints i mean like it is a more like you know the team enjoys it right? yeah that's another component of it yeah we it's a it's a definitely part of our selling sales thing but it's definitely it's not it's not the main thing that will get a company to come and work with us but it mm -hmm. depends on the depends on the organization as well with training with the with the training that I do, um, design sprint boot camps, mm. that is sometimes a um, a bigger selling point than it, than someone just coming to to run a sprint. Yeah, yeah. Because it'd be like a team bonding, um, uh, offsite fun day as well as learning a new tool. So we can kind of sell it like that. Like it's going to be a really fun yeah. day. We have 
people come into our office and you maybe saw at the conference, we have these cool slippers, people take their shoes off and they get into their house shoe slippers when they come here. Oh yeah, let's talk about the slippers because that was actually on my, I was the video you guys made at the, the conference about taking care of the people. I have some just um, here, can I get them? You can. Just a sec. <clears throat> We're talking about experience design. This is this is this is experience design, they're, right? We're, they're not like, ones I prepared earlier. They're, they're really kind of a bit grubby. Hope they don't show up too grubby. And so when our customers and this has got AJS on it, mm -hmm. so they people come in and we have the big shoe rack at the door. And these are some black ones we got, but I think we like the yellow ones better. Yellow's pretty um, nice. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the shoe rack's right at the door. When people come in to do a, a boot camp with us or to come and do a, a sprint with us, that's the first greeting that they get. Hi, welcome. Would you like to take your shoes off and put some put some slippers on? So this is so interesting, and I wanna I wanna unpack this <clears throat> along with, and I wanna compare this to the idea of starting your first sprint. So I've been working on, after, you know, all the time that I've been doing these interviews of like what. One of the things that's interesting to me is that everybody has their own, what I'm calling a conversation operating system, like how they how they like to run and 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 hold space and one of the wake-up calls for me was going on this um men's retreat uh, a couple of weeks back and ah. it was about facilitating uh emotional transformation for for men and it was wow. really interesting that's and, really interesting and you know there was no sticky notes as you might not be so surprised <laughs> i was like how there's no journaling there's no sticky notes like how do you guys have a like a struct you know they have structured dialogue yeah, there's a form to um, there's hmm. rounds of check-ins. Yeah, there are, there, there's a form to it, but the interface is not like our interface are sticky notes and yep. um, AJ and smart has a preference on sticky note size for, uh -huh. for a reason like you yep. guys have um, uh, the ways you handle power. Like you acknowledge, like while while the sprint reduces hierarchies, you also reinforce hierarchies. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And when you were talking about the invitation you want to have to the right people in the sprint to like reach a key goal, like these are the first five. There's there's four others, but like these are things I, I want to talk about these things because it's interesting okay. to me that like designing the invitation of like, would you like to take off your shoes? It's not like take right. off your shoes. Drop, do five push-ups and now put on these yeah. things. Let's, I want to talk about designing the invitation to the right people to do your first sprint. Because yeah. what you're saying is don't get permission, just do it. Oh, well, this is my recommendation for people mm -hmm. inside an organization. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, but I don't know if that's what you... Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, for sure. And then I guess for, for us as well, I don't know, this could also be part of this power the power piece of that puzzle <laughs> yeah. um, is that the way that we've formulated our offer um, of, of doing a design sprint with AJ and Smart is uh, we take complete charge. Like you don't have to, people don't have to be prepared or do anything. They just, yes. they just come. But, um, and so we're running the whole show and it's much less about, um, I had a really interesting conversation with Jake just yesterday, mm. that he likes to, if he runs a sprint with a company, part of it is teaching for him. He's like guiding and facilitating. Yes. But the idea is that they will run sprints by themselves after that, which we're yeah. very happy to do as well. But we we kind of, I like, oh, I'm going a bit off topic now, but I'll, I'll stick with my- We'll follow the thread, we'll, we'll bring it back. That we, uh, we kind of take complete charge, facilitating everything. People don't need to know anything in advance, really, a little bit of stuff we give them. We also totally own the whole prototyping. We go, great, thank you for coming to the workshop part. Goodbye yeah. now, we'll take it from here. Building the prototype and, and getting the user testers for the next day and then running the user interviews and tests and compiling all the information and yep. getting our- It's done for you process. At, at the end. So this is maybe also, a, is that, would you, would you call that part of the power piece of that puzzle? I do, it's interesting that, yeah, because I, I think people like you, me, Jake, if I can put us all in the same category, is like we do, <laughs> we do, we do disrupt power structures when we come into an organization, I think, right? It's yeah. like, or when an organization is even coming to you, right? Like, yeah. it's different because they're coming to your office when you go to their office, but it's much different when somebody, when yeah. you're teaching a group of people inside of an organization and they're like, okay, well now I have to, 
disrupt power the way D does. Like, how do I, how do I get the, ju you know what I mean? Like they don't have, they're not author. They don't feel authorized. Yeah. They are not yeah. authorized in the same way to yeah. book a whole week of people's time. Yeah. That is, it's a big thing. Actually, the, the word authority has come up a lot for, for us here as well. How so? Um, That's a great because, word. Yeah. This is, uh, we had this great, uh, I don't know what you call him actually business coach, life coach not really life coach at all but he was a fantastic guy called sean now i've forgotten his last name we'll call him sean um, his name is sean. but he's, <laughs> he's just he's just coming popping in like every few months to kind of do ge really general kind of business coaching with us but um uh really i've put this into a people that to be a facilitator and a guide this is just one kind of one piece, one principle yeah. is to, if you want to have authority, you need to show empathy first. So mm -hmm. in all of our sprint guidance and sprint facilitation, doing working on an actual product and in our teaching, our design sprint boot camps, uh, at every part of the way, showing empathy that, that you understand, I'll give a real example in a second as well, that you yeah. understand the position that someone else is coming from yeah. and you really empathize with it and then you can say and now and this is the the answer to this and this is what we're going to do now yeah. so the real example would be right at the beginning of our sprint training we um have a presentation that kind of shows that we understand because we've lived it as well the default ways the standard ways that projects usually work and the frustrations that come with misalignments and misunderstandings yes disagreements and changing requirements and all can we kind of picture and diagrams that just kind of show and everyone in the, the audience then at right from the very first half hour is like, Oh my God. Yeah. And who's, who's had a project like this before where you worked three months then six months then nine months then 12 months. And then it never, it's a got real pain. Oh, it's a real yeah. pain. Super basic stuff. It's a, but everyone's like suddenly, Oh my God, they understand my pain yeah. and then go into, this is what a design sprint does it stops misalignments. It stops um, misunderstanding. It stops uh, requirements coming in late because you're doing everything all in, in four days together. It stops this, it stops that. It's the antidote to all of those yes. problems. And so that's this empathy and then authority kind of magic potion. Um, I can't even remember why we started the conversation about authority now, but this has been a huge thing for, for me and us. Well, because you're disrupting power structures. Yeah, that's it. And yeah. the people are giving you a certain amount of authority to yeah. do it. Um, at the same time, it's interesting to me because on one hand, I think structured dialogue allows everyone to have a voice and everyone to be involved. But yeah. um, one thing that, I'm ex that Kai and I talked about before the episode we're going to do is that I think Google proper doesn't have a decider in the same way that Jake's sprint does. Ah. And that's because it's a completely different context. Like it's not a small startup, it's a mature business. Yeah, okay. And, and so they don't have, uh, this is my understanding, they don't have a like, okay, you get a special color um, that where you get to like actually be the person who chooses. So this is a big question of like, structured dialogue allows everyone to get involved and everyone to talk, but then, Either you, either you allow the group to form its own direction, or you say, "Okay, now what direction are we really going to go?" In person who's actually in charge. That's an interesting tension. I yeah, think. yeah, and that's that's something um, that that also about sprints, but also other lots of other kind of processes that have come from design thinking and stuff like this as well. I love when there's a feeling of kind of democracy or kind of inclusion of everyone's input is cumulatively, it's maybe not the right word, but yeah. making up the, the direction yeah. and where the, the, the wind blows is kind of the direction we're going in. And the sprint mm. has that a, a, a lot. Yes. But there is always that, but the decider can kind of override. They can see it's about transparency more than, yes. uh, more than consensus for sure. It's yes. not really consensus, but it's about, the person with the authority in the real situation yeah the person who's actually the person who's gonna get their neck chopped head cut off whatever the sure, thing is, but... does still get to make the call but they get much clearer transparency over over the all the different members of that or stakeholders that have an influence over 
what's going to happen, yeah. um, which I really love as well. So it, I love the mix of this, not really democracy, but really bringing multiple people together so everyone's voice is heard. I love this kind of way of saying this. Yes. But then still keeping the, it's not like the team's going to go back the next week to their company and the boss is going to say, no, I don't like that because the boss would have been the one. Yeah should have been the one in that room. Yeah. And I think there's a, you know, if it's a spectrum, I think it's worth acknowledging like that these power structures do exist and finding a way to like bring it into the structure as opposed to pretend it's not in the structure. Yeah, exactly. There's no point pretending that it's not there. If it is, if it, if, if the power structure isn't there, like I'm really curious now about, um, is, is it because Google was using or is still using the whole you know, and that, that decide if they're, were they using holocracy? I don't remember. Does it I don't know. Holocracy is, yeah. More that's, a whole, roles, that's a whole other, that's a whole other episode. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. So that's really interesting. We, we're definitely using the decider model. Yeah. I think that, and I, and I think it's a, it's a legitimate way of managing faster decisions, disrupting the hierarchy, but also like acknowledging that it exists. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, with we don't have much time left yet. Together, really? I know it's like ten. We have like we have like seven minutes. Um, so I have like a million things to ask you. One yeah. is like um, the all the pieces of paper behind you. Which one of the things that's interesting to me is um, I don't know if you remember the guy uh, who um, I'm, I think it's the the Indian fellow Shuri. I'm blanking out his name. He did a workshop where he did all of his sticky. His, all of his, he only uses tiny sticky notes, like the little itty bitty guys, and yeah. it blew my mind. So I was like, it's really it's you can't fit a lot of information on that. And yeah. um, the AJ Smart people, like you guys, are really into the three by fives. Like, I, the interface of a conversation matters, right? Yeah. Um, when you give a person a larger piece of paper in the process matters. And I'm wondering, like, let's just talk a little bit about the interface of the conversation because oh, yeah. I think it's well, something that you guys control for. Yeah. You and do I, use I, three by three by threes, but but not for everything. With yeah, why? and for a couple of things. It's a really good question. I would also call it the whiteboard for sure, an interface as well. Um, and even the way we do the user tests and things like that. But I guess maybe I feel like this might be even a bit um, fundamental for <laughs> people listening, but we, I, you always think that and sometimes you're wrong, that this is just um, the, the things that you usually use. Let me yeah. um, use a different post to note with text on it. The things that we usually use this for, especially in a design sprint, but in other things as well, it's usually asking people to write down a thought, mm-hmm. I suppose, whether it's your description of, of the bigger a problem that you're having or your own idea for an, a solution. And this, like, I think it could almost just as easily be the three by three as well, but it helps get a few words across. Like you can, you can write big. Yes. You, we make people use markers, obviously like thicker mm-hmm. markers like this for probably reasons that everyone knows as well. Yep. Um, because you want to, fit less stuff on there. You don't want people yes. to write an essay. You want a clear, concise thought. Um, and I feel like actually just the, the width helps. Like, you know, when you're reading mm. an article or something on your phone, yeah. there's a certain number of words that it helps the eye to read across. It just yes. words so it's more coherent to read. To yes. be honest, I never even thought about these things before you're but asking. You, but you have and, though, like implicitly yeah, you have. Not so consciously, yep. Yeah, and this, I mean, my personal passion is getting facilitators to be mindful of the choices that they're making. Yeah. And see if, like, you know, why, why, what's good about it versus what's not good. Like, I, those little sticky notes actually do have some value. Uh, In Luma, Luma uses them for, like, a what's on your radar, uh, like, personal map. And it's, like, you can fit more on a piece of paper. So that's what's good about it. Yeah. It's, like, there's a, you know, it's a choice. And just to quickly keep going with the interface thing for a second, I really think the the choices to use um, white the the whiteboard in the design sprint for making a map, which is like really drawing like just drawing kind of boxes and lines. What's the steps that happen in the in the kind of user journey of the thing, and for um, the storyboard, which is what should we test? How should we test it? What's step one? What's step two? What's step three? Yes, where the whole group can fit and stand up at 
a big whiteboard. I don't know if you can see how big that's the size whiteboards we normally have. Yeah. I'm not in the print room right now. This is actually our. Yeah, yeah. Room. But everyone can fit there standing up and, and looking and watching and not having to crowd around. Everyone can grab a marker if they want to. You yes. Know, you don't have everyone drawing at the same time, but you know, what do you mean by that? And they can just yeah. get up there and draw. So that is an interface as well. Keeps that feeling of inclusion. S totally. And investment from everyone, I can also add my bit to this. Yeah. I sometimes feel like as a facilitator, one of my main jobs is giving a team another piece of paper when they like don't realize they've like boxed themselves into a corner. I'm like, oh, here's another big piece. Why don't you just take two things from that piece and put it over here and make a new one? And yep. you shift the interface and then you shift the conversation that they can have. Yeah, um, it really does. I'm so glad you're asking these questions. I've, these are things that I've never really consciously thought through, but that you're totally right. There'd be d decisions of, well, how about we do it this way? Well, how about we do it that way? And it's all just from this experience of how I feel that like something might work well. Well, you yeah. made these choices with like the storyboard 2.0 where people, <clears throat> instead yeah. of just drawing it up, people draw their own. Yeah. Right. You do this put is... it like, it, I think just doing it straight on a whiteboard would be really hard. You make it, you've switched it, you've evolved it. Well, this is actually awesome, an awesome example. I don't have the three by three post-its here, but we don't actually get people to draw their own storyboard. We, before the storyboarding section, which if people don't know, it's really, you're just deciding what would go on screens of a prototype test or in a physical step-by-step -step physical test. Um, but before you start drawing everything on a big whiteboard and having to get the detail and what's on the button and, and what's the text on the landing page, you get people to just individually in the group, if there's five people in the group, you get all five of them. Right. And this time it's on the three by threes. I think it was just to have a nice little grid, but yeah. maybe also for conciseness. You say, what's step one? Just write step one. Is step one that they right. are on Facebook and they see a Facebook ad? Right. See, these Facebook ad for new product. Step two, um, watch this video that talks about new product. Step three, clicks to do a trial of new product. And, and then everyone like, thinks of their own six steps. Yeah. And then you map those six steps together. Yeah, then we do voting yes. again and figure out figure out which steps are the clearest and simplest to do our test and then we draw. So you're starting with, okay, cool, step one, see Facebook ad. That's easy to draw. We draw a Facebook ad. Step two, <clears throat> video. Draw a video and you don't have to just start yes. from an white board. And, and again, this is structuring the dialogue, you know, just yeah. like uh, importance versus difficulty. You're like, okay, let's talk about the steps before everyone just draws the steps. Yeah. Right? Separating yeah. these decisions out and making them really, really clear. Oh man, is there anything else we haven't uh, talked about that we should talk about with like the three minutes we have left um, <laughs> before we pull the ripcord on this? Oh, you broke up. I'm there. looking, I've really kind of covered everything that was on my little post-it notes here that I wanted to talk about. We did, um, that's amazing. Not really, yeah. I want to thank you for actually making me think about some things that I, that I hadn't consciously really, oh, thought of before, but actually there was one thing this is, I'm sorry, sorry to end with a kind of plug, but this isn't a plug for me. Mm. The name of uh, the business coach that really helped us think about this empathy and authority and lots of other things is Sean Sankey from Form Studio. And he's really fantastic. And I just wanted to mention him because otherwise I'd feel bad that I'd mentioned how great he was and no one could find out who plug he Plug away. Um, anything else we should plug? You guys have a new online course. Uh, we do. I'll, I'll put your Twitter profile up on the, on the, the post. Um, that would be great. Yeah, we've just released actually kind of soft launch last week and really kind of starting to promote it now, a new uh, completely online design sprint masterclass. Yeah. Tons and tons of content that we don't even manage to fit into our live trainings either. Yeah, so you really recorded really a lot so. of videos for that. I, I looked through the through the, the list. It's intense. <laughs> there's so many. You've had a look. Cool. Yeah, yeah there's, there's about 60 videos different instructional new brand new videos. Anyway, I, I feel awkward when I actually have to <laughs> like things, but thanks for, thanks for giving me that opportunity. Of course. And this has been really fantastic, interesting conversation. I can't believe how quickly an hour flies by. I am always happy to talk to someone who's passionate about designing better conversations for people because it's pretty much all we've got. It's what we do every day. Yep. And yep. if we can do it better, then things will be awesome. Yeah. So, I think Ways to think about how that works because I've already learned a lot of new things from listening to your podcast and from this conversation. That's awesome. I really, I'm super grateful that you came on. Um, I'm going to call and scene on the, on, <laughs> we'll just, thank you so for your time. Yeah. I will stop recording. And if you want to stand for one more second. Oh yeah, sure.
we'll just say goodbye. All right, yeah. Break out. Bye. Bye.